AlexNet from 2012 was the first large-scale convolutional neural network that was able to do well on the ImageNet classification task. In, in 2012, AlexNet was entered in the competition and was able to outperform all previous non-deep learning based approaches by quite a significant margin. And so this was the confidence that started the spree of convolutional neural network research and their usage afterwards. The basic confnet AlexNet architecture is a, a conf layer. It's a convolutional layer here followed by a pooling layer followed by pooling, normalization, convolution pooling, and a few more convolutional layers and pooling layers, then, then several fully connected layers here. So this actually looks very similar to Lonet, doesn't it? There are just a few more layers here in total, and the image sizes, the input sizes, are considerably larger. There are five of these convolutional layers <coughs> and two fully connected uh, layers before the final fully connected layer going into the output classes here. So Ale AlexNet takes as input these 224 by 224 images. So you can basically rescale your input to this size to make it fit the input tensor for, for AlexNet. But as a considerable, considerable difference here is this takes 224 by 224 by 3 and 3 is of course 3 channels each for R, G and B so we are dealing now with color images. In the convolutional layers it uses 11 by 11 filters at a stride of 4. Other people showed later that uh, this is not ne really necessary and smaller filter kernels uh, do the job as well. Back then this wasn't known yet, so 11 by 11 filters it were. And we have a couple of fully connected layers here of size 4096 and finally the last layer here, so this fully connected layer is, is going to the softmax, which is going into the thousand classes of ImageNet. So we have also a considerably larger output amount here, uh, which is now thousand classes instead of 10 as shown in Lenet 5. If you look at this AlexNet diagram, uh, it looks kind of the normal convolutional neural network diagrams we've seen, uh, except that there, there is one difference, which is that you can see it's kind of split here, right? So this has two rows, and the reason is mostly historical. Uh, this AlexNet in 2012 was trained on all GTX 580 GPUs, and these cards only had three gigabytes of memory. So it couldn't actually fit this entire network here on, on these cards. And what they ended up doing was they spread the network across two GPUs. So this is one GPU and this is the other GPU. Exactly identical architecture here. So on each GPU you would have half of the neurons or half of the feature maps. Right, so you're halving these layers in neurons and uh, halving these feature maps here. And so, for example, if you look at the first convolutional layer, we have 55 by 55 by 96 output in the definition of AlexNet. Uh, on, also on each GPU, so that means on each GPU I have 48 features, uh, feature maps extracted here on each of the, of the GPUs. What happens is that for most of these layers, for example, convolutional layer 1 here, 2, 4 and 5, the connections are only with feature maps on, on the same GPU. So you, con you continue convolving with the same um, uh, feature maps. So you would take as input half of the feature maps that were on the same GPU as before and you look at the full 96 feature maps, for example, when you then continue to convolve. And then there's a few layers. So, so this third layer here, uh, uh, as well, I think the, the sixth layer, seventh and eighth, 
uh, where the GPUs do talk to each other. And so there are, in fact, connections between the GPUs where things are getting synced. So there's, there is some communication across GPUs and um, each of these neurons, for example here, each of, of these neurons are then connected to the fully connected layer that's then run just on one GPU and you're outputting your final result on a kind of master GPU here. Nowadays you get this overhead totally for free. Back then it was serious engineering effort again, but for example with PyTorch data parallel features you would get something like that uh, more or less for free. So le let's look at the data what AlexNet was uh, optimized to solve. And uh, the, the ImageNet challenge here, uh, this is a data set that came out in 2010 and it was a really big data set at the time with 1.2 million examples and thousands of, of classes. The images were of considerable size, they were 469 by 387 pixels. And if you compare this to MNIST, where well, most of the MNIST sets you find nowadays have 28 by 28 pixels. Um, there's now also color, so we have three channels. While uh, this is this is mainly mainly gray. Well, this is only gray values. There are variants of MNIST that come in color, but the basic MNIST dataset is is gray values. And now the sample size is considerably larger compared to the 60,000 samples you get in MNIST, and the classes uh, again are by a factor of uh, 100 larger than what you have in the digit recognition task. So until 2012, around the time when AlexNet won the ImageNet competition, the default strategy for solving computer vision problems was to go and pick manually engineered features and apply an SVM in the end. Um, so if you if you came up with a smart strategy to handcraft features, then you were pretty much sorted, got tenure, and had a good career um, in, in, in computer vision. Now this was replaced by features that were learned automatically, followed by a softmax function, and, and that pretty much defined a paradigm shift for the computer vision community. But AlexNet wasn't just a uh, bigger and better, uh, a bigger and better learned uh, five architecture, there were a number of key changes as well. One was, for example, dropout regularization, which allowed people to design much deeper networks as you move to much deeper networks. We're now dealing with uh, five convolutions and three fully connected layers. Um, well, of course, just regularizing with regard to the input doesn't help so much. So you need to also regularize the inner structure of the of the network. So so this is what really was also introduced with RxNet, where regularization were applied to all the layers, or at least uh, in multiple places, where you can, for example, use dropout and, and not only in one place. Whereas otherwise you would just smooth things uh, with regard to the input if you only do if you only add dropout for example at the beginning the second thing was really using railers so rectified linear units replacing the otherwise quite common sigmoid nonlinearities in in networks and so so we're replacing the sigmoids by just the maximum between x and zero which had as a consequence that the gradient would no longer vanish because you had at least half of the space, so when you built the derivative, you had at least half of the space where the function was the identity going in the backward path. So there will always be a gradient to update. Another thing was uh, max pooling. So to this point, average pooling was the common thing to use in networks, but max pooling was um, really replaced average pooling at this stage um, because the result was that we become a little bit more shift invariant with max pooling because you could now move your attributes a little bit and max pooling would still pull the relevant attributes through while average pooling would depend on the entire window where you build your average from. 
So to eventually win this challenge, they also had to use heavy data augmentation, which we will discuss in a future video. And so, for example, cropping and shifting rotation of the inputs together with model ensembling. So they trained multiple versions of their model and then asked these multiple versions for an input about their prediction and then they built the average, basically a majority vote for, for, the, for, for the output. This makes usually uh, classification approaches more robust uh, towards perpetrations. So all of this led to a paradigm shift in computer vision and after computer vision, well, that's then when people went on and applied these networks to speech recognition, uh, natural language processing, text generation, very popular examples recently like GPT-3 and, and a lot of other things. Now, if you look at the complexity of such networks, well, <coughs> AlexNet was, a mu was much more complex than LearnNet 5. In terms of computation, it's 250 times more expensive. In terms of parameters, it only needs 10 times more. Um, so, so this is really another key change that the trade-off between computation and memory changed quite a bit. And AlexNet is actually known for being rather extreme in terms of, of memory usage. Some more modern networks wouldn't use that much memory anymore as AlexNet did. So nowadays that ratio would have been probably even more skewed towards compute because compute devices like GPUs have become a lot faster and therefore people really like to exploit that. Now I really wanted to show you a demo of uh, using AlexNet in the wild, but uh, AlexNet is probably a historic node by now, so I couldn't really find one and really the output wouldn't be so uh, so great to watch because all you could see is a slightly worse classification of the input images of the, in the test set of, of ImageNet. Instead, uh, I'll, I'll show you what people thought in 2012, what's now suddenly possible with uh, computing algorithms. It's ready. Please, God. What will you say if I told you there is an app on the market. We're past that part. Just demo it. Okay. Let's start with a hot dog. Oh shit, what's up? That is great. Oh, what the fuck? What's up? Julianne, my beautiful little Asiatic friend, I am going to buy you the palapa of your life. We will have 12 posts braided palm leaves. You'll never feel exposed again. I'm gonna be raped. Fuck you, go for it. Let's do pizza. Let's do pizza. Yeah, let's do pizza. Hey, Zach. Not a hot dog? Wait, what the fuck? Eh? Huh? That's, that's it? It only does hot dogs? No, and a not hot dog. And you can try and think about how you would implement this in uh, in, a, in a deep network. It's probably not that trivial as it looks like in the show. That's right. Now, this is how you can implement your AlexNet if you want to reproduce their results. Nowadays, again, it fits nicely on a slide in PyTorch. And uh, what it also shows here is a consolidated diagram of AlexNet, uh, not split in, in half for the two GPUs. You can still train it on multiple GPUs, but PyTorch would nowadays take care of this for you. So really what we need to do is again, collect the functions we need. We need 2D convolution functions, uh, ReLUs, uh, max pooling. So we start with three channels coming in. We want 64 feature maps coming out here at a kernel size of 11 by 11 at a stride of four. Right, this is kind of per perhaps the key line here, which makes AlexNet quite distinct from other networks. And, uh, and of course, at the time used the use of max pooling. And we have our five layers here. The other thing you can see in this code here is that we can um, collect network parts or entire networks in NN sequential which then forms a whole uh, network so we can uh, use this directly 
in the forward pass and pass the input through the entire network at once or like here through the two parts of the network because here I have the I've kind of separated the uh, to the feature extractor then uh, I do an average pooling across these to make them fit here into the linear units uh, also activated by, by Railus. But this kind of shortens your your forward pass a little bit, which is uh, nice.